Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God, our Father, and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Weeks before I actually write a sermon, I look ahead to the readings that are assigned for that weekend. Now, most of the time when I read the Old Testament, New Testament epistle, one story pops out and it's fairly obvious, and many times the other lessons will point to that story or, or support it in some way, but not so with this weekend's readings. And as I read through the lessons, I noticed quite a few major topics here. In Genesis, we jump from creation and, and Adam naming the animals, and then we go to God's design for marriage, and then we go to Hebrews, to Jesus coming to earth in our place and taking the punishment for us. We go to Mark to, do, to divorce, and then we go to the, the children coming to Jesus, and, and he blesses them. And these are all great lessons, of course, but which one do I choose? I couldn't choose just one, and I'm guessing you don't want me to preach 20 minutes on each one of those. So what I did was read them over again, and I prayed, and I read them over again, and finally a common theme emerged. There is one thread, one theme that runs through all of these lessons from Genesis through Hebrews through Mark. I'm going to give you a hint as to what this is. You probably can't read the words, but can you tell from the color and the shape what this is? This is crazy glue, okay? Do I got, I got to make the picture bigger? <laughs> this is crazy glue. How many of you remember that original crazy glue commercial, though? That big construction worker, and he puts that little dot of glue on his hard hat, and he sticks it to the steel beam, and there he hangs in midair. As the announcer exclaims, crazy glue, strong enough to hold this man suspended in midair, and his legs are kicking, and he's smiling. My first question for you, has anyone ever gotten it to work that well? I have used crazy glue many times and never, ever did anything stay together except for my fingers on my glasses more than once, suspending them in midair until I tear them from my flesh. For the younger ones in here, if you don't remember the crazy glue commercial, take Gorilla Glue, the big gorilla that lumbers around helping all the people glue things together that they don't know how to do. It's the same thing. You can use both of those. So the main theme that's running through these, that these commercials point to, is the bond. The bond that we have with Jesus Christ. Now I admit this was a very cheesy illustration, but I bet you don't forget it. So now let's look at our lessons for today and see where this bond between us and Jesus is. We're going to start with Genesis, and we're going to look at verses 23 and 24, which read, then the man said, This at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they, the two shall become one flesh. Now this is God's institution of marriage, right? We've all heard this many times because it's spoken at just about every wedding we go to. We also heard it referred to in our gospel lesson for today from Mark with a little bit of a variation. Mark 10, verses 6, 6 through 9 say this, and this is Jesus talking, but from the beginning of creation, so Jesus is referring to the Genesis account, God made them male and female. Therefore a man shall leave his mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. And then Jesus goes on. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. He emphasizes that. What therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. So Jesus added something to this, didn't he? What therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. So how does this correspond, though, to the bond between us and Jesus? Now, you need to know that this bond, this two becoming one flesh, is more than just a physical bond. 
It is more than the consummation of the marriage. It's, it's more than a contract. It's more than a roommate agreement. There is so much more to it. And the answer lies in Ephesians, where Paul refers to this Genesis, a passage of the two becoming one flesh, and he says in Ephesians 5.32, this mystery is profound. A mystery is something we can't comprehend. He says it's profound, and I'm saying that it refers to Christ and the church. That is the type of bond there is between us and Jesus, that of a man and woman that God brings together, the two becoming one. Now, how strong is this bond? We need to go back to that verse 9 in Mark where Jesus said, What therefore God has joined together, let man not separate. The King James Version says, Let no man put asunder. Many of us recognize that from wedding services maybe a few years ago. They don't use that as much anymore, but I wish they would because there's a difference here. Asunder is a better word than separate. To separate is, is just too easy, I think. You, you, have, you have the man and the woman becoming one flesh, let no man separate. It's just too easy. We separate apples from oranges. We, we separate um, our peas from our mashed potatoes. We separate the cereal from those delicious little marshmallows, and of course we keep those for the end, right? That's separating. Now this is what the word asunder means. The two become one flesh, let no man put asunder. Asunder means to tear apart into pieces, to destroy. So the two flesh become one. We are seen in God's eyes as one flesh. And to take the two apart is to actually tear flesh apart, to tear it apart, to destroy it. This is a little more descriptive, isn't it? But that is the bond between Jesus and his bride, the church, us. To separate him from us would be to destroy the church, to tear it apart into little pieces. And thanks be to God, we know this will never happen because Jesus tells us in Matthew, in reference to his church, the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. That's how strong the bond is. Another example of the bond between us and Jesus is again from the Gospel of Mark, verses 14 to 16. It says, Let the little children come to me. Do not hinder them, for to such belongs the kingdom of God. And truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. And he took them in his arms and he blessed them, laying his hands on them. Now here, instead of child, a better definition is, is infant, and we note this when we have a baptism. It's, it's infant, or it's really newborn. In fact, one of my professors said a better translation is, is even fetus. The point being that the bond that we have with Jesus Christ is that of an infant and the mother. A, a newborn or a fetus is totally dependent on the mother for everything, for life itself. And that is what Jesus means when he says, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child, like a newborn, shall not enter it. So not only does this mean that infants are capable of God-given faith, which is a completely different sermon, but it also means that we are totally dependent on what Jesus has done for us, for our salvation, for life itself. That is how strong the bond is. Another example of this bond is found in, in, in the Hebrews lesson. Verse 9 said, But we see him for, who for a little while was made lower than the angels, namely Jesus, crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death, so that by, grace, by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. Jesus became one of us in every way except for sin. So many times the best managers, the best bosses, the best parents, the best teachers, the best leaders are not afraid to get their hands dirty. They're not afraid to ask you to do anything that they haven't done themselves before and wouldn't do again. To use a, a, a very overused phrase, they have been there, done that, so they understand what we're going through. And Jesus did this, but so much more. 
He came to earth and he was faced with the same pain and the, the same temptations, the same hunger and the same thirst, the same sadness and so on that we face. Hebrews 4.15 says, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every way, in every respect, has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Except he took it much further than this, didn't he? He loves us so much that he took our punishment that was meant for us, he took our place on the cross that was meant for us, and didn't even ask us to do it. There is no greater love, there is no greater bond. John 15, 13, greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. And what a friend we have in Jesus. But why? Why this bond? Well, we don't have to go any further than the beloved John 3, 16 for this. Because God so loved the world. Because God loves us so much that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. No matter how badly we mess up, no matter how much we sin or what the sin is, God loves us. So strong is the bond, by the way, that it has nothing to do with what we do. So strong is the bond that our sins are forgiven and we are saved through Jesus Christ completely. Which is good, right? Because if it was up to us, we wouldn't do very well at keeping this bond strong. How often, several times a day, do we take our families for granted, we take our marriage for granted, we take our friends for granted, and we certainly take Jesus for granted. And when this happens, we repent. We repent, and our sins are forgiven. This is his promise. This is his promise in his word, which proclaims the good news of salvation. This is his promise in holy baptism, where we are made a part of God's family. We are adopted into his kingdom and heirs to his kingdom, our sins being washed clean by the waters. And this is his promise in the Lord's Supper, his supper, the New Testament, in his body and blood, which forgives and strengthens us. The bond cannot be broken. We are forgiven. We continue with confessing our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed as found on 